Um, so if you haven't gathered yet and kind of how we set this up, um, we're really trying to, to look at road salt in particular from a regional perspective, narrowing down on Mirror Lake. And so um, I will speak to what I'm sure most of you are here to learn about, which is specific to the impact of road salt on Mirror Lake and the work that we've been doing over the last two and a half years on the lake. I want to start off by just giving you a little bit of history uh, on the research that's gone on in Mirror Lake um, as far back as we've been able to, to tell anyways. And so in the 1970s, or 1971 and 1974, the Lake Placid Shore Owners Association commissioned a study of Mirror Lake in both of those years, uh, or, or sorry, Lake Placid, but they had the forethought to include Mirror Lake in that work. So, that's kind of the, one of the first data points that we have about the water quality of Mirror Lake was back in the early 1970s. Um, we also have been able to acquire some unpublished data from Don Charles. Uh, he, is, uh, he was in the Adirondacks in the, in the, around 1976, uh, working on his PhD work on the impact of acid deposition on lakes in the Adirondacks. Um, thankfully, through some connections that I have with my graduate supervisor working with Don on that work, um, we were able to get a copy of a field notebook that's been sitting on a shelf for ever since then that has some data about Mirror Lake, and that data point ends up being really important. Um, Corey also was helping us look for data on Mirror Lake and dug up a series of reports that Paul Smith students uh, did on Mirror Lake in the, in the mid to late 90s and 2000. And again, I imagine that for the most part, those reports were done in a limnology class and got filed away in a filing cabinet and sat there ever since without anyone really being aware in the Lake Placid community of what they found. As Bill mentioned, in 1998, the, the lake was enrolled in the CSLAP program, Citizen Statewide Lake Assessment Program. It's a volunteer program and Mirror Lake Watershed Association has been um, conducting that monitoring through that program ever since, with the exception of two years. Uh, again, Lake Placid Shore Owners Association commissioned a study to look at Lake Placid. Uh, we're kind enough to include Mirror Lake, and so we have a report on Mirror Lake in 2001 from the Upstate Freshwater Institute. And then in 2014, uh, Larry Master, who's in the audience, chair of our board and uh, part of the Mirror Lake Watershed Association, enrolled Mirror Lake in the Adirondack Lake Assessment Program. It's very similar to CSLAP, called ALAP, run by the Watershed Institute and protect the Adirondacks. One important difference between those two programs, though, is that ALAP looks at salt concentrations in the lakes. Uh, CSLAP, up until recently, did not. And so it wasn't until 2015 that we had the first report come out in Mirror Lake that really made us aware of the impact that salt was having on the lake. And so immediately after that, um, ASR and AWI, with support of the Mirror Lake Watershed Association, the town and the village and the Ironman Foundation and the Department of State, started developing a, a research and monitoring program specific to Mirror Lake so we could understand this issue in more detail. So what do we actually do? What does that mean? Um, well, we're out on Mirror Lake every other week throughout the entire open water season. You, I am out there the day after the ice goes out, so that's a really important time of year for Mirror Lake, and we'll find out more about that. We also go out in the winter. If you ever see someone drilling a hole in the ice, some of you may have called the cops on me the first time I did this. <laughs> some poor DC person came out, totally unprepared to be out on the ice in the pouring rain in the middle of the winter to bust me for ice fishing, only to find out that we were collecting water samples and, and had permits and we're all, we're all good. So we visit the lake about once a month in the winter. Um, we also uh, monitor the storm water that's coming into the lake on occasion. I'll show you some data from that. And we're also uh, involving uh, youth, teenagers, in this work as well. So we bring teens out into the lake in the summer and involve them in the research. And, and this young gentleman is collecting data that you will see in this presentation today. So. Early this year, we came out with this report co-authored between uh, Osceola River Association and the Adirondack Watershed Institute 
um, on the work that we've done on Mirror Lake. But the really unique thing about this report, though, is we combined all of the data from those various sources into one report. As far as I'm aware, this is the first time that we really have this long-term, complete picture of how the water quality in Mirror Lake has changed over time. And you can go on our website uh, to download that if you want to see it. We don't have, we had a few printed copies, but we don't have many available anymore. Uh, and the major finding that, again, I think probably everyone in this room is aware of is, was the impact of road salt. Um, so this is looking at the chloride concentrations in Mirror Lake from uh, 1976, Don Charles' unpublished data that we didn't know about until a few months ago, um, through 2016. And so we have a concentration uh, in milligrams per liter that is, is pretty much the same as parts per million, as Dan presented. So we see this significant increase in chloride over this period of time. So to give you uh, uh, some points of reference to just where Mirror Lake uh, was and where it is now. Lakes without roads in the Adirondacks, as, as Dan mentioned, the mean chloride concentration is 0.25 milligrams per liter. So in 1976, when Don Charles visited Mirror Lake, it was about four milligrams per liter, so 16 times higher. We would have said back then, if we knew what we knew now, that the lake was impacted by road salt in 1976. Well, today we're at about 40 milligrams per liter at the surface, so that's 160 times higher than what we would expect the concentration to be in Mirror Lake. So where is all the salt coming from? Uh, it's probably, the answer is probably obvious, right? Uh, Mirror Lake is one of the most, has one of the most developed watersheds in the Adirondacks, and that development, as we all know, is concentrated right around the shores of the lake. And uh, what happens is all that impervious service and development, when, it, when we have runoff occur, it goes into the stormwater system, and that stormwater system discharges directly into Mirror Lake. So what we put down on our sidewalks, our roads, our parking lots, our walkways, that's all going to get flushed right into Mirror Lake. Um, as Mayor Randall mentioned, though, they took out a couple of these data points over here for us by diverting the stormwater away from the lake. So those, those outfalls or contributions have, have since been removed. So what we're looking here on this map is uh, the concentration of chloride coming out of the stormwater, the stormwater outfalls in February and March of 2016. At this time, we were just beginning to understand the impact of salt in the lake, and one of the major questions was, where is the salt coming from? That, that's still a major question that we don't have a complete answer, but uh, we wanted to figure out if the, salt, if the salt was primarily coming from this little section of State Road here, we would expect high concentrations on this side of the lake, but not quite as high on the other side of the lake. When we went and looked at what what was actually coming out, we saw that there's high concentrations of salt coming out of the outfalls around the entire lake. So it's, uh, while we sh certainly should focus on working with DOT, and, and they're a major contributor, uh, when we get down to this individual watershed scale, um, we have to start looking at those other sources. They can be really important. Um, just to give you a sense, the larger the dot, the higher the chloride concentration, Highest reading we got was 955 milligrams per liter. So several thousand times higher than what we would expect in an Adirondack stream, say, that wasn't impacted by road salt. The inlet, which has uh, just above Mirror Lake Drive, which has a bit of private road uh, in it, uh, that was 0.4 milligrams per liter. So that kind of gives you a sense of where we might expect Mirror Lake should be, what the reference condition is specific to Mirror Lake. Well, when all that salt runs off the watershed through those storm waters, that stormwater system, uh, when it enters Mirror Lake, because it's a small water body and has a relatively simple basin shape, it underflows. So you imagine a pipe over here, if this is the cross section of the lake. It underflows the lake and settles down into the bottom of the lake. That salt coming out at 955 milligrams per liter is more dense than the water in the lake, so it flows underneath and settles. Because we're out there in the winter monitoring, we can see this accumulation and buildup of, of the saltier water at the bottom of the lake. What we also see in some years is that 
In the spring, when the lake would naturally mix and turn over, salt water per I was out on Mirror Lake on Monday, which might have been a slightly foolish uh, endeavor, but I survived. I'm out there collecting data, and uh, on Monday, the lake still, the buildup of salt or chloride at the bottom of the lake is still present. We expect that it will turn over in the fall and, and go back to uniform uh, concentration of salt. And then if we, next spring, more than likely, we'll see over the winter the buildup of salt again in the lake probably won't turn over next spring. So that little animation and, and diagram is a really simple way of conveying what took many, many hours of work and nearly a thousand data points to understand about Mirror Lake. And this is, this is more you know, gate, uh, geared towards the, the scientists in the room, but this is the raw data about the chloride concentration in Mirror Lake. So on the x-axis we have May 2015, through uh, Monday, and on the y-axis we have the depth in the water column, so surface of the lake up here, bottom of the lake down here, and the colors correspond to the concentration of chloride in the water. So if Mirror Lake weren't impacted by road salt, we would expect the concentration to be, you know, maybe 0.25 or 0.4 milligrams per liter. The entire panel here would be dark blue. We don't really see any. We see a little bit up here, and that's really probably an error in the fact that when I drilled a hole in the ice, a bunch of fresh water that was on the ice poured down the hole and probably diluted our, our measurements a little bit. But what we see is this, uh, in 2015 and 2017, this buildup, this higher concentration of salt in the bottom of the lake, and the highest concentration we've measured was this past winter where we were persistently around um, 100 up to 120 milligrams per liter at the very bottom of the lake. So if we were just looking at the surface, we would miss a lot of the story about what's going on with Mirror Lake. What's also interesting to note is this didn't happen in, in 2016. We had some buildup of salt in the winter, same as we see in 2017, but the lake turned over and completely mixed in the summer, and we see this uniform salt concentration throughout the water column. The black line on here represents in tons the total amount of chloride retained in Mirror Lake. So the range is from 150 to 180 metric tons. Uh, to give you a point of reference, that would be uh, something around 10 to 15 big plow trucks full of salt, but that would be just the chloride fraction. So then you've got to add the sodium in and that number goes even higher. So, we would expect Mirror Lake to have about one to three metric tons, and it's between 150 and 180. <clears throat> We're beginning to understand with this data how salt builds up in the lake and how it accumulates in the winter and how it flushes out in the summer, and eventually we hope to be able to, to understand this well enough that we can predict what's going to happen to Mirror Lake in the future. If we continue to salt the way we are, what might the concentrations be like in 10 years? If we reduce the salt input by so much, how is the lake going to respond to that? But it takes a lot of, a lot of data and a lot of work to collect uh, the data that we need to answer those sorts of questions. So I briefly mentioned the lake isn't turning over in the spring, or it didn't in 2017, it did in 2016, we think it didn't in 2015, but we're out, we started our monitoring a little bit too late to to know that for sure. Well, for lakes in our area, like Mirror Lake, uh, that, are, that are relatively deep, we expect them to go through this progression where in the summer months, the surface of the lake is warm and the bottom of the lake is cold, and so that surface water traps that cold water at the bottom. That, that, those bottom waters don't ever have an opportunity to exchange with the atmosphere. Um, but then in the fall, as we cool the surface, this water has this unique property where it's most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. As we cool the surface, the water is getting more dense and it's settling through the water column until eventually the lake completely turns over. As we move from fall to winter, it kind of goes in the opposite direction. As we cool the surface more beyond 4, the water is starting to get less dense again. And so it's zero at the top with a sheet of ice on top. And again, the lake is kind of capped off these bottom waters. And in fact, the entire water column can't interact with the atmosphere, and then in the spring as we warm from zero to four, we get more dense, the lake turns over again. 
And so Mirror Lake didn't experience turnover in 2017. We don't think it did in 2015 either. So one of the, the big questions is, uh, why? Is that because of the buildup of salt in the bottom of the lake? And the analogy I like to make about that salt layer in the bottom is imagine you have a bottle of Italian salad dressing that's been sitting in your fridge. You got two different liquids, two liquids of different densities, your oil and your vinegar. It takes a bit of energy to shake that Italian salad dressing up till it's homogenized again, right? And so by having two uh, liquids of different density, we have to put in more energy to mix those two together. So we've been thinking that for a while that that the reason the lake wasn't turning over was because of the salt, well, we finally are, be, are able to, to put some numbers to that and model this and, and begin to say that with a little bit more confidence. So what we did um, just recently is we modeled the amount of energy that we would have to apply to the surface of Mirror Lake to mix it completely in the spring right after the ice went out. And so this is, uh, the units are a little strange unless you're a physicist, but it's gram centimeter per centimeter squared of lake surface area. You can just think of it as the higher on this bar, higher we are on that bar, the more energy you need to put in. Or if you think of your Italian salad dressing, the harder you would have to shake the bottle. And so in 2016, uh, there wasn't as much salt build up in the bottom of the lake, and we see the amount of energy required for mixing was relatively low as in comparison to 2017 when we had that salt build up in the bottom of the lake. And so this shows us and gives us quite a bit of confidence that the reason the lake didn't mix in 2017 was because of the salt that was accumulated in the bottom of the lake. We went a little bit further though and we, we modeled the energy requirements if the water column was of uniform salinity. Because even in 2016 there was a little bit more salt in the bottom than there was in the top. And that's what these, uh, the second set of bars is, is what would the lake be if, even if there was salt in there, but if the salt was evenly distributed. And again, if you look at the difference in the energy requirement to mix in the spring of 2017 compared to what it would be if that, that salt was evenly distributed, I think it's quite obvious that the presence of road salt means that we have to put a lot more energy in the lake to get it to mix. Why is this important? Um, this mixing period redistributes oxygen and nutrients throughout the water column. And that's a really important process for a lake, uh, especially a lake like Mirror Lake. So this plot here is of the dissolved oxygen concentrations in Mirror Lake over that same time period, similar to the, the plot we just looked at. And so, um, I'm going to zoom in on this and just look at 2016 and 2017. So in this, as ice went out in 2016, the lake turned over, we had uh, high dissolved oxygen concentrations from the top of the lake to, bo to the bottom. As a, as a point of reference, if you're a, a cold water fish like a lake trout, you really want 7 milligrams per liter or more, so this kind of gray color. Um, you're starting to feel a little bit of, bit of stress at 4 milligrams per liter and you're really not doing too well or, or not surviving at less than 2. So if we just look at the two years, the amount of oxygen in the bottom of the lake, I think it's obvious what the impact of not the lake not mixing is to those dissolved oxygen concentrations. Instead of starting the beginning of the summer and spring with well oxygenated water from the top to the bottom, we start with depleted oxygen at the bottom. And then as the lake is stratified in the summer, this water is kind of trapped down here. There's bacterial decomposition occurring, the fish are breathing, insects and everything that are down there are using up oxygen, and so that oxygen gets depleted. This is natural phenomenon to see in the lake. But when we start out with depleted oxygen, we just the situation kind of gets worse from the get-go. A concern for our cold water fish, like lake trout, is that at the end of the summer we end up with a thin, narrow band of water that's left that's both cold enough and well and enough oxygenated enough for them to, to survive. Even if we weren't applying salt to Mirror Lake, we would 
want to have this on our radar because we're learning that, that across the range it's stratified longer. We're keeping this warm water cap on the lake for longer periods of time, and so it, we're letting the oxygen depletion build up for, for longer as a result of that. With Mirror Lake, though, when the lake doesn't mix in the spring, we kind of start the stage for them bad to begin with. And if we just zoom in on, and look at the data on this, let's look at July, middle of July. We're going to look for that point where there's more than 7 milligrams per liter. So down to a 13 meters, there's more than 7 milligrams per liter of oxygen. Great conditions for the lake trout. If we go to July 2017, we're only at 8 meters. So five meters less of the water column in that period of the year that are available to those species. So if you take three things home today about Mirror Lake, um, one is I would argue that it's the most impacted lake from road salt in the Adirondacks. We know from work that Dan and Corey have done that the surface water concentrations are up there. It's in the 97th percentile of out of all the lakes that they, they work on. But of course, we also saw that if we looked at the whole water column, those concentrations are a lot higher at the bottom of the lake. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only lake in the Adirondacks that's experiencing an inhibition of its natural turnover because of the presence of road salt. And I think that, along with the concentrations, puts it up there in terms of impacts out of water bodies in the Adirondacks. And that because it's not turning over, the, low, the oxygen concentrations in the bottom waters of the lake, that should be a concern if, we're, if we want to see our cold water fish species persist. They're the thing that most people care and respond to, but that lack of oxygen has a lot of other implications about the chemistry of the lake, and nutrient cycling and leaching of, of heavy metals out of sediments and those sorts of things. So there's other reasons we should be concerned as well. And I just want to finish by sharing a little bit about kind of ASRAs, and I, and I think I speak for our colleagues at AWI about what our goal is with what we're doing on Mirror Lake and why this is a concern for us and where we want to go in the future. Well, we want to conduct rigorous science and research around, on Mirror Lake, um, and we want to establish a long-term monitoring program. I can't help to think if we went back to the 70s and started doing this work when Don Charles first took that water sample, where would Mirror Lake be today? Would it be, would we be experiencing these problems with turnover and road salt buildup? I don't think we would because I know that the people in this room and the town and the village are committed to addressing this issue and I think they would have been committed back then if we knew what was going on. And we want this work to make informed, smart decision making to, to protect Muir Lake. The data that we're collecting and the research that we're doing can help us understand, you know, if we do this, how will that impact Muir Lake? If we divert stormwater, how will that affect the recovery of Muir Lake? If we, and how will it impact the Chubb River? You know, if we reduce the salt loads applied to the roads by 50%, how will that impact Muir Lake? Will, the lake? will we expect the lake to start turning over again? If we switch to an alternative product, is it going to be better for Muir Lake or is it going to be worse for Muir Lake? We also want to gauge the effectiveness of the management actions. We're really excited. A bunch of stormwater got diverted. We've been monitoring the lake for a couple of years. Now we get to see what impact that has on the total amount of salt entering Muir Lake. And does it make a meaningful improvement to the condition of the lake? And as we do that, we want to share what we learn with others so that other communities that are dealing with these issues can learn from the things that we're learning in Mirror Lake. As Mirror Lake and the Village of Lake Placid make uh, changes to what they're doing, we can document whether they're effective and we can share them with other people that might not have the resources available that, that we do here. So I just want to finish up by acknowledging and thanking our funders and partners. Uh, really, I think Corey and I talk about, and Liz too, about Mirror Lake probably on a weekly basis, sometimes more often than that. And it's great to have them to communicate with and to think about these things. 
Um, the Mirror Lake Watershed Association, they've been with us all along and, and helping to raise funding and awareness of the work that we're doing, and we really appreciate them for that. I can't speak highly enough about the Village of Lake Placid and the town of North Elba. Uh, the, the board members and trustees and, and, and those two municipalities have been super supportive and receptive to everything that we've been doing. We've, they know most of this because we go and talk to them about it. And what we want to do, begin doing, is making others aware and, and, and having a broader conversation about these issues around Mirror Lake. And then the Iron Man Foundation and the Department of State have financially supported the work as well. So I, I don't know how much time I have left, but... If you want to take a question, it sure. would be great. Yeah. Um, good, good science work. The, the excellent presentation. My question is, taking a look at the 2016 to 2017 and the turnover, did you think on looking at the severity of the winter? Um, because I know from our research down Lake George, we found obviously the winter was not as severe down there, and there was a use of, uh, we, we estimated about 30% less road salt. So right. I don't know if you looked at that, and that could give you some direction on finding that now. Yeah, I mean, we know that um, the winter in 2016 was different for a, num for a number of reasons. It wasn't as severe, there was rain every month of the year. Um, so, I think that as material was applied, it was kind of flushed immediately, so we didn't ever see as high concentrations um, as, as we might in 2017. Those numbers that we reported for the stormwater in 2016, it might have even been higher if we would have sampled in 2017. Um, and I believe the village was experimenting with a brine solution that winter as well, or I, I don't know if to, how much of the, the period of time if that was being applied. But I mean, it is on our, our kind of our list of things to do though, is to get a weather station um, near Mirror Lake so we can better understand how temperature and precipitation are changing and we can model runoff from the stormwater system. So we have a little bit better handle on, on those sorts of things. Yeah, I think we were kind of lucky though that that we had this nice comparison literally right after we started our work uh, to look at. Here's sort of a non-scientific question thought. The salt that I see going on the road mixes with water or something or the soil or something like that. It doesn't go away. It's still there. It's in a different liquid form, so to speak. We can't see it, but it goes into the lake. Yeah, absolutely. So it's still there. So when you see a truck going around the lake unloading its salt, that's leaving that salt in that location. Right. Yeah. And so then next time it rains, yes. or even in the case of Mirror Lake, even the melt as the result of the de-icing, you know, that's going to make its way into the stormwater system. And it's that like is sand, lake. where sand we can see. The salt we can't because it mixes. Yeah, I can't anyway. Maybe someone else. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks.